Hi, this is Lori Liker, Managing Partner at Search and Convert. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're talking about chat and GPT and AI when it comes to writing and graphic design and all things creative. And we've got a great panel with us today, so I hope you enjoy. Hi, thanks for joining us today. We've got with us PJ Christie, our founder and CEO. We've got our creative director, Casey Taylor, and we've got our content specialist, Aaron Springler. And uh, two of us, are, um, three if you count PJ, and Casey as our creative director handles all of our graphic design and the final product of what we put out. So today we're gonna to talk about AI and its use in writing, specifically with chat and GPT. And PJ, you were showing us a little bit about what chat GPT can do. Why don't you fill everybody in on that? Yeah, sure, thanks. And, uh, and welcome to our work from home realness, everybody. <laughs> this is how we do it. Um, so, uh, so, uh, with the big discussion lately is about AI and how it's, you know, it's this paradigm shift for everything. And, and certainly that's, I'm not going to say that that's not true, but to say that it's like caught marketers by surprise is really not true either. I mean, we've been using AI for, uh, you know, a lot of things, just, just, you know, in terms of keyword research, we use a lot of AI. And when we come up with the uh, blog post titles that we recommend for our customers, uh, we use a piece of AI that's built into the SEMrush tool that we subscribe to. So, uh, so a lot of this stuff is kind of new. What's exciting about ChatGPT is just how conversational it really is uh, at the at the top level. So, um, I demoed uh, my ChatGPT to a client uh, last week who was kind of new to uh, to understanding. Oops. Bear with me here. This client was kind of new to understanding uh, Chat GPT and what and how it could change the way that he does marketing for his business. So I showed this one first. This was uh, my my first documented Chat GPT. It was uh, I asked the question, which King Crimson album would I like? People who know me know that I'm really into music, and and uh, Aaron matches my my encyclopedic knowledge of prog rock here so uh so the, i like this example because because i know aaron gets it so uh so the the uh the chat says uh, it's difficult to re recommend a specific king crimson album which is true without knowing more about your musical preferences king crimson is a progressive rock band so you know some pretty definitive stuff here they get uh it, it does provide with some titles that i could start with um I took this as a little bit of a prompt for me to provide more information about my musical preferences. So I highlighted that what I was really interested in, and if you're really into King Crimson, there's like the Adrian Palou people and the Robert Fripp people, uh, both outstanding. But I, I'm more familiar with the Robert Fripp version of the band. So I was wanting to drill down on, on Adrian Ballou. Uh He says, well, Chat GPT says, well, if you enjoy Adrian Ballou's work, you may enjoy the King Crimson albums, and then gives a much more uh, detailed version about his contributions on these albums, which was exactly, it was, it was helpful for me. Um, and then when I, I asked the next question, which drummer was in the band on those Adrian Ballou albums? Because if you're really into prog rock, that's, that's an important question. You want to make sure that it's also the drummer that you're really interested in. Uh, so, uh, in, and so as I, as I went through this, he says, uh, uh, Bruford left King Crimson again in 1984 and replaced by Tony Levin on subsequent albums. Well, that's not true. Anybody who really knows their prog rock knows. Go ahead, Aaron. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> muted. You put me on the spot. Yeah, it's only them play bass. Yeah, that's right. Obviously, he's a bass player, uh, uh, an innovative bass player uh, that you know people who know know. And so, uh, and so then I love how Chat GPT says, "You're correct. My mistake." Tony Levin played bass, and Chapman Stick on the King Crimson album. So this was really, this was I think really illuminating because it it also shows that uh that it's not immune to making mistakes um i'm not fact checking everything that it provides me here but at a certain point uh it uh, it was funny to reach a, a place where my knowledge 
exceeded what it was able to come back with, given the questions that I was asking. Um, PJ, a quick question. Would you then be able to take all of this information if you were going to write an article, for instance, on King Crimson? Would you be able to take all this information and plug it into an article? Sure. Let's say that let's say that uh, uh, in my case, I am a musician and I and I uh, have my outlet for music and it would be uh, uh, I'd be able to use this and say, you know, uh, which which King Crimson? King Crimson album does PJ Christie recommend? And then I can actually uh, get what I would think would be the dates right, uh, the names right, some of the titles right. That that gets me a long way towards the kind of research to be able to put put this into some kind of a, a of a you know some kind of a curated uh, curation list kind of thing. Um, also, I have some other examples to show on this. I like this one. Um, because in my household, every morning it's uh, French press and scrambled eggs. Uh, just that's just how it goes in my house, right? So we had a debate about how many times you should beat the scrambled eggs to get them just fluffy enough. Does that make? Does everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? Um, so uh, so it's pretty good that that ChatGPT says it's not necessary to beat it, beat them a specific number of times. But this is this is. You know, this, if this is what you're looking for, these are some things to to do, and it gives me a nice direction for it. And then I like, I also like the question: How long should I steep my French press? In my household, some some people steep it as long as they they pour it, walk away, come back later. <laughs> Nobody uses the timer that's right there on the on the oven. So anyway, so now every morning at breakfast, I have perfect fluffy eggs and perfect French press, thanks to ChatGPT. <laughs> so useful so stuff. When, when you're using ChatGPT, there's a lot of controversy about it. And that's kind of where I wanted uh, our discussion to go today, since all of us have an opinion on how this is used. It's a lot of controversy in the education field, especially that students are using this to create their papers without doing their own research, without doing any fact checking like you did, and going back and just copying and pasting it into an article. In the writer's community as well, there's a lot of uh, debate about whether or not this is a good thing. Um, and I know Casey, in the, in, even in the uh, graphic design area, there's a lot of controversy about it. So um, let's go around the room and just kind of get everybody's opinion. PJ, what do you think? Uh, I don't find it very controversial. I, I find it a, a questionable utility for some applications, uh, a lot of utility for other applications. Um, but uh, I, I welcome our AI overlords. <laughs> Aaron, well, what you about you? That way. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, like, like PJ said, you know, it's, it's utility, it's a tool, um, and not every tool is set out to accomplish the same job. So um, tools break, tools don't always work out. So I mean, checking, fact checking, making sure that it's in a voice that is true to a brand, especially if you're writing for a specific brand is very important, I think. Casey, what do you think? Mm. Uh, I'm, I guess I'll play devil's advocate. Um, I think with great power comes great responsibility and not everyone is going to operate with the ethical standards that we pride ourselves on at Search and Convert. Um, this morning on the news, I heard of a, um, an online scam where they used uh, the AI uh, Dolly or one of the image AIs to make to make a fake image of the Turkish earthquakes and then they used it to um, try to get donations out of people. Um, oh wow! And so I think when it comes to that, hmm. using any of these AIs, you, transparency that you are is is crucial. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, there's always going to be there's always going to be the bad guy. Somebody's always going to figure out a way to use it incorrectly, like the deep fakes everyone's worried about. For me, I as a writer, it I have a, a strong reaction to it on both sides. 
on the one hand, it's already true that people don't value writers very well. Um, business owners think, well, I could write that. You can write it, I can write it, but they can't. And there's so much bad content out there that I'm worried that the AI will, one, devalue writers even further, and two, will uh, produce just as bad content because people are copying and pasting it. On the other hand, for a writer uh, to be able to pull this information out and edit it and put it together in a logical fashion, like you were demonstrating, PJ, I think it's a great tool, but I don't think it's something that people are going to use wisely, as you said, Casey. Casey, you, you told us uh, the other day about a, uh, a children's book that was all AI, both the graphics and the, and the text. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, um, it was a podcast that I was listening to um, that was, uh, oh, I posted it. Who was it? It was um, it. Illuminati yeah, is mm -hmm. the name of the podcast. Um, mm -hmm. And there's been several books published, novels um, that were written entirely by AI. They do, they do disclose that um, at some big publishers, but the one that they specifically talked about was the first that was written and illustrated entirely by AI, um, a children's book, and you can buy it now on Amazon. And it's about a little girl learning that um, you have to uh, be responsible with how you use AI, actually. <laughs> so it's kind of a, it's very meta. Um, PJ, when it comes to using the tool, the chat, chat GPT tool. I know we, as you mentioned, we use AI a lot for things like generating headlines, generating copy for ads, um, things like that. And that's been around for a long time, but why do you think people are so afraid of AI? Well, the people that I talk to who are afraid of AI are really just, uh, they're, they're people who are overall just kind of freaked out about the whole thing. Right, not just not just AI, but the the entire march of technology uh, as it occurs. And um, you know, there was a there's a, a book that came out a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago now, called uh, "Weapons of Math Destruction," and it highlighted a lot of inequities um, in the way that data is managed and the way the algorithms uh, come out. And um, uh, and uh, you know, through speaking through some of the people I know through our Black Businesses Matter, I think the other thing is just that it reinforces this like dominant language or dominant culture uh, that that more than just how it, it, it while it, in one case it devalues creativity, right? By by making input so massive, uh, the creative process is much more uh, about refinement uh, in there. But what it does for language is it really sort of reinforces what I'll just call the white voice, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and and it says that that is the authoritative voice. And so the, the people I talk to are, are worried about equity, you know, um, uh, that and that the the authoritativeness of it just rubs them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Aaron, from your perspective as a writer, what do you think about um, do you think that this is a long-term solution for some companies to just go with AI, or do you think that it's going to reinforce the fact that you need a writer or an editor to be able to put copy together that's good and fresh? Well, well definitely an editor. I mean, I would say first and foremost, anything you're writing with AI, like I said, definitely you should be editing that, making sure, fact-checking, you know, all that. Um, but I think what it's going to do is really position smaller companies who otherwise wouldn't have the manpower, you know, to be able to produce consistent content on their blog to be able to use that as a tool. Um, again, it's you're going to spend as much time, I would imagine, editing it and looking through it as you would maybe proposing new ideas. But it's definitely a good jumping off point for companies to generate ideas. I mean, like we do already. 
Um, and then using those ideas, running with them and really making them your own. Um, kind of going back to what I was saying before, you know, honing in your brand voice um, is really important to be able to resonate with your customers and potential customers. Mm -hmm. Casey, from your perspective, do you see this co AI coming in? You said there's already a, a children's book that's illustrated by AI. And I've seen stuff on, on my Amazon Echo um, about help your kids write their own story, um, which is an AI. Um, do you see a time when the same type of thing is going to happen more mainstream for the design field? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, designers in general, I think we're always afraid that something's coming for our gigs because like you were saying about a writer, um, a designer has got the same experience that a lot of times the client doesn't understand or appreciate how much thought goes into the choices that we make. And so, you know, my kid could do that. My kid could paint that. Um, my cousin can make websites. Um, but with tools like Canva um, was a big step, but you had, the difference was the input. You have, you still have people with an untrained eye or um, less of that natural talent trying to make things. So you gave them a tool, but you didn't give them the knowledge. And with the AI and like the massive amounts of, of data that it goes into it to, to make these choices, I think for sure. Um, but if AI wants to do the busy work, so we as creatives have time to do um, a larger and more interesting projects, I'm all for that. Google or uh, AI can make my Google ads all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> PJ, from, from the beginning, I, I think back to the Luddites who were smashing looms uh, in, in the first industrial revolution back in England. Um, everybody's been afraid that mechanism is coming for their jobs. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it shake out where, yes, it has, but it's also created other jobs. Um, how do you think this overall is going to change the marketing industry? Well, I think the worst of them will get will look better. That's that's the good news, right? Like all marketing will probably improve because of it, uh, uh, which is good. You know, nobody likes to be operating in a world full of, of bad marketing. Uh, um, I think uh, you know the unfortunately the most of the best advice I hear people giving brands is going the other direction to be more authentic and more focused on on what your customers want to say. And, you know, that, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about just, just, you know, having a, having a natural voice in your brand. And also, uh, you know, Chad GPT, at least it only works up to 2021. And, you know, it's two years later, if your brand wants to uh, uh, have anything to say about current trends as ours does, right, frankly, uh, we're not going to be able to count too much on chat GPT for some stuff just because the algorithms have changed in two years, just, you know, to be frank. So, you know, uh, issues of timeliness, uh, while I say that that all marketing will get better, um, the people who are really have their finger on the pulse of technology and innovation are not going to be impacted by this at all because chat GPT has, I mean, not to say that it's useless, but, you know, it's of limited utility when it comes to like, you know, the, the most recent Google updates, for example, the algorithm mm -hmm. updates. Um, yeah. That's an interesting point at how the, the nature and the voice of chat GPT is goes against the social, social media era and that authentic voice. I think that's a really excellent point. Aaron, do you see this impacting social? Um, Honestly, I not not a ton because already with social, it's it's such specific copy um, that is so short. I mean, nowadays Facebook recommends thirty characters or less on Facebook posts for optimization, okay. which is barely anything at all. Um, and while that seems like not a lot of work, even I mean, choosing your words wisely and knowing you know how to reach your you know target demo in that few of words is is a challenge. I mean, it's an art in its own. So. I don't necessarily see it as a real threat to that. Um, kind of like Casey said, you know, if they want to write blog posts or write, you know, do the busy work that 
you know, marketers otherwise wouldn't necessarily want to do. I'm all for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been a fascinating discussion. We all have our, our opinions, but I think one thing that we agree on is that uh, technology is going to continue to move forward and you either adapt or you die. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and since we are in the adaptation business, um, we adapt very well and uh, with PJ's leadership uh, here at Search and Convert. So any last words, uh, PJ? No, nope, just, uh, just try to keep it real, everybody. Aaron? Likewise, yeah. <laughs> keep it real, <laughs> literally. Casey? Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We hope that, to see you back here with our next installment of Search and Convert Conversations. Thank you.